Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to WITMIX's webinar, Hazard Communication, the Connection Between OSHA and the Department of Transportation. Uh, this morning, the webinar will be given by Harold Ingmeyer. My name is Bernie Jaroslow. I'm the Marketing Manager for WITMIX, and I'll be facilitating the webinar this morning. So I'd like to begin with a few housekeeping items before we start. Uh, first, in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you'll see a questions box. Uh, please feel free to type in any questions you might have throughout the presentation, and Harold will be answering those, but not until the end of the webinar. So just type them in and, uh, and be patient, and I promise we'll, we'll answer all the questions. Uh, next, if you are a CDT or a recognized graduate, uh, the webinar is approved for one hour of CE credit towards your recertification. Uh, you'll receive an email within one to two days from now that will explain how you obtain your credit, which is pretty simple. You'll have a, a, an easy test, uh, and, and after that, we'll, you'll send that in and we'll, we'll take care of your credits. Uh, this morning, I have the pleasure of introducing Harold Ingmeyer. Harold's uh, the or has been the uh, Human Resources and Safety Director for the Whitmix Corporation since 1997, with prior experience in human resources and industrial safety since 1979, and also with experience in the food and automotive industry. He has a Bachelor of Science degree in Animal and Food Science from Oklahoma State University uh, back in 1975, and has served three years in the Army. Today, Harold will be speaking on hazard communication, the connection between OSHA and the DOT. Hazardous Communication Standard, or HAZCOM, is a standard developed by OSHA that requires companies to identify substantive substances or chemicals that may cause illness or injury to uh, its employees or the consumer of the products, and communicate these hazards through training of employees and providing communications to the employees and the consumers of the products through labeling and SDS or safety data sheets. This OSHA standard is also aligned with the international labeling requirements referred to uh, as the globally harmonized system of classification and labeling of chemicals, shortened to GHS. So I felt that this was a good program for dental laboratories because we do deal with with hazardous materials and uh, and even more so as we're starting to get into the 3D printing uh, resins and it's important for us to know how we how those materials should be handled and uh, Harold's here to tell us about it so that's all I've got so Harold if you're ready let's talk Hascon. Bernie thank you for the introduction. Uh, We'll be reviewing the Hazardous Communications 2012, the revised standard, which is an OSHA regulation that also incorporated the GHS or Global Harmonized System, which is an international system. The statement, the standard gave workers the right to know, now gives them the right to understand, is a critical difference. The key words are right and understand. And the slide won't go down, Bernie. Sorry. Oh, I'll keep talking. And I'll... A brief history of my experience with hazardous chemicals. Bernie covered some of my history, but I think it's important uh, when I've got into this training over the years is how people can apply their particular experiences uh, to doing hazardous communication because it's usually totally out of people's background. Uh, my career in safety began just a few years after OSHA was created, a long time before there was a hazardous communication standard, but amazingly my education and experience provided me with a lot of tools to get where I am today. Uh, my education included a lot of chemistry, biology, physiology, and really enjoying doing research even before the internet. In the Cold War Army, I received depth, in-depth training on chemical, biological, and nuclear warfare, which included identification of really hazardous substances, testing for chemicals, use of PPE, treatment of those exposed, decontamination, decon processes, much from the civilian world, which derived as procedures. In the food industry, we dealt with chlorine and ammonia leaks, chemical sampling, and use of safety equipment. Uh, in the battery industry, I got to my first medical surveillance program that was specific toward lead-related medical conditions, respirator programs, 
and detailed personal hygiene programs. And we also had thousands of gallons of battery acid. At the automo other automotive plant, we made dashboards for automobiles using huge quantities of isocyanates, one of the key components to the foam in the dashboards, and the effects of sensitizers. Uh, I've been with Whitwick since 1997, learning much about dental lab business and products for some of the best CDTs and chemists in the industry. At Whitmix, we may we have a myriad of hazardous chemicals, including silica, resins in the base components, petroleum products, alcohols, caustics, and a host of other small quantity but hazardous chemicals. Uh, in all these variety of industries, I have seen that maintaining a safe work environment saves money in many ways, and you had the privilege of protecting your employees. The goals of this presentation uh, is to protect the things you love, yourself and your employees, uh, your profits, improve your bottom line. A safe working environment is truly more productive in volume and quality. Start you on your way to designing your own HASCOM program. And to reduce risk, OSHA, workers' compensation, absenteeism, and other legal actions. There's always definitions. The HASCOM standard, which is from our OSHA, is now aligned with the United Nations driven globally harmonized system of classification and labeling of chemicals, GHS for short. The purpose of the standard was to ensure chemical safety, provide information and training that is understandable to employees, such as in chemical manufacturers must evaluate the hazards of what they produce. They must develop safety data sheets, or SDS, and labels to communicate that hazard and to hold manufacturers and users of hazardous materials accountable. GHS, keep in mind that worldwide, a significant portion of our workforce is illiterate or semi-literate at best. So we use symbols and training to assist in protecting them. North America, the EU, and Asia have bought into this concept, but it's an ongoing process in much of the third world and some Eastern European countries. This simple flowchart gives an idea of the flow of the process. Manufacturers are responsible for identifying the hazards of what they make and labeling those containers. They also develop and provide SDS to end users. The employer is required on training and protecting those employees by developing the HASCOM program, ensuring they understand HASCOM, ensuring labeling is correct and maintained, and enforcing the requirements in your facility. If you have hazardous chemicals, you are required to implement a hazardous communications program, HASCOM, that meets the requirements of the standard. You can do this. You are a science-based technician dealing with in, in taking hard cases and giving people a smile. Step one is to learn the standard and ID responsible staff. Use the internet and do go to www.osha.org. Study it. If necessary, find a safety consultant. You have to do more than a point. You have to train your responsible individual. And using the OSHA website, it has some excellent plain English FAQs and handouts. It will reduce your pain in trying to read the actual standard. Appoint and train the responsible person. They need time to train and time to keep the program up to date. This last statement is very important. You need to make the person appointed believe this is important work for your company. While time is money in most labs, find a way to make this worthwhile for the responsible person. Labeling, everything is labeled. Fat gram, salt, MSG, protein, the list goes on. Hazardous materials have specific information that must be included. One is the product identifier or name. You may find the common name doesn't always match the product identifier. The signal word is either danger or warning. The hazard statement, what it does to you. Pictograms we'll cover in a bit in detail. Precautionary statements of the handling, storage, and safety, and so forth. And the name, address, and phone number of the responsible party. These label components are the key points you will need to know and find in your SDS and train your employees to a level of understanding.
Use the OSHA standard. They have an outline and some very good links to go through and documents to, to essentially use and copy. Prepare your written plan. The link you see on the screen in front of you, the OSHA.gov backslash DSG backslash HASCOM, is a wealth of information that covers in detail the information I'm providing in this webinar. The next step is to develop a chemical inventory. You need to prepare a list of all products in your facility. Dental products, chlorine, bleach, whatever you may have under the sink. Check all your cabinets and drawers for chemicals and document all. Write down the name, the product identifier, found on the label, the hazards, and the manufacturer contact information. This will get you started on collecting the safety data sheets you must have for your program. There are several ways to find the SDS you need. Go to the manufacturer's website. If they don't have a list of products like we do at Whitmix, they should have a contact or customer service, technical services email or phone number. When you start looking for the SDS, be sure you have the actual name of the product. You will find some interesting differences in SDSs and the warnings, even if the product identifier is the same. So, if you have two boxes of silica-based dental products from two different manufacturers, you will need an SDS for each item. Same goes for chlorine, bleach, motor oil, or anything else. The HCS pictograms and hazards. This is some basic must-know information to understand HAZCOM, HCS pictograms and hazards. These are required on labels of hazardous materials. They are not required to be on the SDS, but the information they represent must be. So let's go through these symbols. Also, OSHA has an excellent quick cards for your own training and the training of employees, which is on the screen now. You can find it on the OSHA website. It's a great handout uh, for posting in your business at, on the bulletin boards or handing out to your employees doing training. The first two it covers is health hazard. Uh, the health hazard involves hazards that affect any and all organs that may cause debilitating disease or death after exposures. Anytime you see this symbol, closely research the SDS and prepare to train and equip your employees before they use the product. This covers things such as carcinogens, mutagens, reproductive toxicity, respiratory sensitizers, target organ toxicity, and aspiration toxicity. The one on the right, the exclamation mark, covers a wide variety of hazards and what they cause to the human body. This includes irritants, skin sensitizers, acute toxicity, especially harmful, narcotic effects, respiratory tract irritants, and hazards to the ozone layer, which is done mandatory. The next is the flame. Uh, these two can be confused, the flame and the flammable circle. You may well have materials in the flame category, such as gasoline and alcohol in your facility. This includes flammables, pyrophoric materials, self-heating, emits flammable gas, self-reactive inorganic peroxides. Oxidizers include oxygen, many acids, bleach, many nitrates and nitrites. It creates a hazard by causing combustion of a material. The gas cylinder or compressed gas is commonly found on propane cylinders, compressed canisters such as spray paint, acetylene cylinders, and more. The contents themselves may not be hazardous, but the potential rupture of the valve being knocked off creates a missile. The corrosion symbol is very apparent. Chemicals such as this causes corrosion and chemical burns. So we're talking about skin corrosion and burns, eye damage, and corrosive to metals. Think what a leak could do to electrical wires or metal containers of other chemicals. Environment. Well, I'm, I'm, is it not? It's a non-mandatory symbol. It's to give you information of concerns about appropriate disposal of a product or chemical. In certain states, such as California, this can be very important to know the information.
is refers to. The skull and crossbones, nothing to do with the Pirates of the Caribbean, indicates chemicals that have acute toxicity or are fatal or toxic if ingested, inhaled, or absorbed through the skin. The exploding bomb. This includes explosives, self-reactive chemicals, and organic peroxides. If you go in the south round, firecracker stands. Step three is ensure your containers are labeled. Chemical manufacturers and importers are required to provide labels on ship containers with the following information. The product identifier, the signal word, the danger or warning, pictograms, hazard statements, precautionary statements, and the name, address, and phone number of the responsible party or manufacturer. Therefore, when an employer receives a hazardous chemical from supplier, all of this information will be located together on the label. However, additional information may also appear. As the employer, you're required to ensure the containers in the workplace are labeled. You may use the same label for the supplier, or you may label workplace containers with alternatives, such as third-party systems, the National Fire Protection Association, or hazardous materials identification system, in addition to the other required information. This is an example of a label from the OSHA standard. It's a very basic label. It has the product identifier, the HS85, batch number 85L6543, uh, has the exclamation point or, and warning and not danger, and it says it's harmful to swallow. It also has a statement there about personal hygiene, about washing your hands and face after handling and so forth. Uh, the manufacturer elected to put a first aid statement on there about swallowing, call the doctor if you feel unwell, and it has the mandatory uh, address, name, and telephone number of the manufacturer. In workplace labeling, okay, the first item, OSHA allows options, some of which you may have seen over the past several decades. They use a color-coded system and numbering of hazards, with four being the worst and one the least hazardous. The new GHS system is just the opposite. One is the worst, four is the least hazardous. The second item requires manufacturers to update labels and SDS to be sure everything is current every three years. What wasn't hazardous last week may be considered hazardous today. This third item refers to secondary containers, which is very important in labs and manufacturing. Example, you pour alcohol from your purchase container into a smaller jar. The smaller jar is now your secondary container. If and only if these are used by one person, it does not require a label. If it may be used by more than one person, the OSHA standard requires the workplace labeling include, I quote, the product identifier and words, pictures, symbols, or a combination thereof, which provide at least general information regarding the hazards of the chemicals, and which, in conjunction with other information immediately available to employees under the hazards communication program, will provide employees with specific information regarding the physical and health hazards of the hazardous chemical. This would refer to the safety data sheet. It's important to keep that in mind, but secondary containers are one of the biggest sources of individuals getting poisoned at work, getting injured, burnt through caustics because they don't know what's in the container. If you'll note the illustration at the top of the page, it shows two lab techs uh, using a sniff test to identify a chemical. Proper labeling is much quicker and safer. The next is maintain your safety data sheets. Safety data sheets are the source of detailed information on a particular hazardous chemical. Employers must maintain copies of SDS for all hazardous chemicals present in the workplaces. If you do not receive an SDS from your supplier automatically, you must request one. You also must ensure that SDS are readily available to workers when they are in their work areas during their work shifts. This accessibility may be accomplished in many different ways. You must decide what is appropriate for your particular workplace. Some employers keep the SDSs in a binder in a central location. Uh, some people outside the safety office, in the pickup truck, in the construction site, uh, or in the manager's office. Others, particularly in workplaces with large numbers of chemicals, provide access electronically. 
However, if SDSs are supplied electronically, there must be an adequate backup system in place in the event of a power outage, equipment failure, or other emergency involving the primary electronic system. In addition, the employer must ensure that workers are trained on how to use the system, system to access SDSs and are able to obtain hard copies of the SDSs. In the event of a medical emergency, hard copy SDSs must be immediately available to medical personnel. The next piece is the safety data sheet in the 16 section components, which we'll cover a little bit on each section. Uh, I'm going to use the Whitmix SDS on their model OS Reach OSHA. Reach is an EU format that is required in most EU countries, but generally has the same information. You can find all Whitmix product SDSs on our website at www.whitmix.com. If you have difficulty finding what you're looking for, please contact our customer service department. Section one is the product identifier and name and manufacturer details and contact information. This also has key information for labels and secondary containers. Section 1.4 is the company contact information. Section 2 is very critical information. It lists the hazards and the severity of these hazards. A level 1 is the most severe and level 2 less severe and so forth. Note you have a caustic warning, a health hazard, and environmental hazard of this particular product. Note the H numbers at the bottom of the page and on the next slide, P numbers. These are standardized numbers that many companies use to standardize specific phrases for labeling purposes. The numbers are optional. These are the P number statements. You'll see a lot of these on many labels uh, you see on Whitmix products and other products you may have in your facility. The H and P number statements were designed to standardize language used worldwide in developing safety data sheets. Section three lists the ingredients by name, CAS number, percentage, and category of hazard. This information is used for several items, knowing what specific chemicals to test for if air sampling or other samples, determining safety precautions, assist medical personnel to know what they are dealing with, used to create a final product SDS which is used as a component. CS means chemical abstract service, which is a unique identifier used worldwide. Section four first aid measures are very important to all of us. Knowledge of first aid measures not only help reducing the damage to the victim, but also protects first responders, such as the EMS and ER staff. You don't want to create additional victims. Other issues not has come, but covered by OSHA would include eye washes, how you flush out eyes as required, and decontamination, how to and what to use to decontaminate an individual. Also, you need to send the SDS with the EMS and inform EMS when they arrive what chemicals the victim was exposed to. Or if necessary, you can fax the SDS to the emergency room. This reduces the guessing by medical personnel on how to treat a contaminated person and also how to protect themselves. Section five is firefighting. This is usually important to your sprinkler system company, the fire station company, building inspectors and property owners. Section six is about accidental release measures, how to collect and dispose of spilled chemicals. Section seven is handling and storage. Uh, this consists about storage of temperature, sunlight, and reactive chemicals, things you don't want to have it stored next to. And the purchasing storage cabinets for flannel materials may be required. Eight point one is exposure control. This is the OSHA levels of exposure allowed, be it fumes, dust, or other exposures. In our manufacturing environment, where we have tons of silica-based materials being manufactured and packaged daily, we have routine air sampling by a certified industrial hygienist to determine if we have certain jobs or areas requiring respirator wear. 8.2 is on monitoring or exposure controls. Uh, this gets our air sampling requirements. 
and uh, determining ventilation requirements. Uh, it also gets us very important to personal protective equipment needs or PPE. It's very important to ensure your employees are protected before they handle the chemicals. It's very important to have the right PPE for the job. This may include safety glasses, respirators, chemically impervious gloves, aprons, face shields, and so forth. Section nine, physical and chemical properties give you information such as, is they liquid, a solid, or a gas? In the case of dry ice, it can be a liquid or a gas. Uh, the smell of it, the color, and there's other detailed information it, will, it may have in the description. This is important identifying spills of materials when you're not sure of the source or sharing this information with the fire department if they ever have to come to your facility. Section 10, stability and reactivity, generally provides information relevant to storage and transportation. There are some chemicals that just don't play well together, and so you may have to have those stored in different areas or fireproof cabinets and similar devices. Section 11, toxicological information. This lists the potential health effects. It has acute toxicity, da toxicity data and effects on your body parts, such as your skin, eyes, respiratory system, specific organs, reproduction issues, carcinogenicity, and so forth. Section 13 through 16, section 13 is disposal. This can be very critical to your waste disposal company in your community. If you have a metropolitan sewer district, there are certain things you do not want to put down the drains or the sewers, so it will mess up the entire system. Uh, if you put toxics or, excuse me, uh, flammables down the sewer systems, it can cause explosions uh, through the sewer systems at all. And certain states have very high levels of control over these items here that you need to be familiar with. Section 14 is transportation. It's important if you ship materials by air, rail, or truck, which includes, of course, UPS, FedEx, and others. The Department of Transportation, or DOT, regulates how hazardous materials must be packaged and shipped. They even have their own labels for trucks, rail, and so forth, you see every day on the road. They are different because the DOT is purely United States, and the GHS is international. Section 15, the safety, health, and environmental regulations, uh, includes such things as Sarah Title III and other state-specific regulations. It's very important you read through those based upon the areas that you work in and have your products stored in. Section 16 is anything not included elsewhere. It can be the author of it, the date of the SDS, uh, other information you may need. This is very important to inform and train employees. Paragraph H of the HCS requires that employers train employees on the hazardous chemicals in the work area before their initial assignment and when new hazards are introduced into the work area. This training must be conducted in a manner and language that employees can understand. The good news is most safety data sheets that you'll train off of come in many languages, especially in Spanish and if Europe in somewhere between five and 10 different languages. They must know that labels and safety data sheets can provide them with information on the hazard of a chemical. These items should be consulted when needed. In addition, workers must have a general understanding of what information is provided on labels and SDSs and how to use them, access them. They must also be aware of the protective measures available in their workplace, how to use or implement these measures and when. Again, as you're concerned about language barriers, Almost all SDSs in the United States can be had in Spanish. All the REACH documents or the European style safety data sheets will normally have five or more uh, language variations based upon the, the countries this product is sold in. Training, training the label elements we've discussed. This is their first line of defense against hazards with chemicals. Uh, when you train on the SDS and the elements and where the SDS is located and how to access the SDS. Some of the training requirements. You need to understand the requirements of this section 
and also the employees have to understand the requirements of this section. They must know where hazardous chemicals are present, where they operate. They must know the HAZCOM program is maintained, a list of the hazardous chemicals, that's the chemical inventory we talked about, and how to access the safety data sheet. Kind of a wrap up here. Uh, one, you need to read and study the OSHA HAZCOM standard. Search under hazardous communications on the OSHA website. Assign and train an individual to be responsible for the program. It is important. Do a thorough chemical inventory. You'll be surprised if you find how under the drawers in the cabinets around your facility. Collect safety data sheets for every hazardous material you have inventory. Acquire, issue, and train employees on personal protective equipment, be it nitro gloves, face shields, safety glasses, and so forth. Train employees in the overall program and be vigilant on buying new products that you review the labels and acquire safety data sheets as needed and training the employees. This screenshot comes to the OSHA website, the Department of Labor, uh, and those particular links there you'll see down below uh, go to all the information you really need to design your hazardous communication program. Uh, it has the information for small employers. It has all the standards. It talks about labels of pictograms. 99% of all the information I presented today I acquire for this, these particular links on the OSHA website. Even if you decide to hire a contractor to develop your program, if you don't want to do it yourself, you need to read and understand HAZCOM as you are ultimately responsible for keeping it up to date, your employees trained and accountable. What are your rewards into this? The pure joy of regulatory compliance. Actually, the relief you're, relief you're in compliance. Improvement of work performance and quality. Improve, improve employee morale. And the true feeling you protected what you love. That is the end, end of the presentation. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Harold. Good information. I see there's one question, and also I want to remind everyone that the that uh, the CE credit will be sent to you. You'll all get a an email within one to two days maximum, and uh, it'll explain exactly how to get your CDT credit for recertification. And uh, and also this webinar will be up on our website again within 24 to 48 hours so uh those of you who maybe are on multi if you have multiple people on a on a particular computer then um each of you can get the credit how you'll do that is you'll go on to the webs our website go to webinars uh, in about one to two days and you'll have to watch the webinar or at least start it and then it'll show you how to uh, access your credit and we will take care of all that and Harold, there's one question which I think was addressed in there, but is there an app for the SDS sheets or software? There are some applications that you can buy online out there. Uh, you just need to see, I guess, how big a volume you have. And again, I'd say you probably should look at the, the uh, website itself on OSHA to see what do you really need to have. Now, there are some companies we have, like we use one here, but we have over a thousand safety data sheets of Whitmix that we take care of. Uh, it's an online process, but there is uh, some companies will provide you uh, smaller methods to do it based upon your size of company. Okay, we have another, a couple more. Um, what do you mean by training EEs about the requirements of this section? It's in step five. What do you mean by training EEs? about okay. the requirements of the section. Okay. These, this OSHA standard says you're required to uh, train each employee once when they first come on board about your hazardous communications program. And in theory is every time you have a new chemical come in or if a change in the safety data sheet, you're required to train the employees on that particular information. But there is no really requirement to do a training on an annual basis. Okay, uh, how often must refresher training be offered? Well, again, as I said, the, uh, there's really no requirement to do a lot of the training on an annual basis. It's not a bad idea. It only takes about 15 minutes to bring out your SDS book, talk about the chemicals you have, 
and make sure you review people on the personal protective equipment uh, because personal protective equipment is technically covered in another OSHA standard. That's wrong requirements on that. Okay, and that's the last of our serious questions. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Kent, I'll get back to you with, on your question later. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, don't forget to go on uh, the, the website within a day or two if you haven't heard from us uh, about the CE credit and we look forward to hearing and seeing you on another Whitmix webinar. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.